Hey everyone, happy Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever day it is, wherever you're watching. We're just glad that you're here. So welcome. Um, my name is Jackson. I'm the youth director here at Pathway Church. Happy to welcome you here online. You know what? Let's uh, let's have some engagement. It's sad that I can't see you, but you can see me. Uh, so how about you go ahead uh, in the comments or maybe just to the person next to you. Tell me, tell us, tell the person around you. Uh, what was the highlight of your week? One, one good thing that happened to you this week. Um, yeah, I'll wait. Wow, no way. This is me, this is me scrolling through the comments. You don't say, wow. Hmm, the zoo. Oh, cool, cool. What about this side? Oh, no way, a roller coaster in February. <laughs> wow, wild. <laughs> I got candy, I don't know why. Uh, so let's see if it works. If, uh, if you respond, if you commented, this is this is for you. Ready? Oh. Okay. Okay. We got we got a tootsie roll or a tootsie roll, as I've been told it's been called. That was a good one. <laughs> um, for real. What do we need to know today? Uh, February 10th, there's a ladies event coming up at the Bridge North Library. Um, if you'd like to register for that, go to pathwaylife.com slash beloved. We'd love to see you there. Uh, if you have been part of this church for a long time or you've never met with us in person, this is a great event for you to come to. Uh, there'll be lots of snacks. There's a word from Tracy Ann. Uh, so join us for that. Um, it's also the first Sunday of the month this week. Uh, which means we get to take communion together online. So if you haven't had a chance to do so already, go uh, get your elements, um, and we will be uh, taking communion together online today. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to spend some time in worship together. So we'll go do that now. See you guys. All right, well, let's sing some worship together. This morning we're excited that uh, we have a God that fights our battles for us. Amen. the battle you see my victory all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move through the shadow your love surrounds me The battle belongs to you
stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Well, sing a little louder. Uh, today we're kicking off a brand new uh, message series. In fact, we're actually going to start a study in which we're going to walk verse by verse through a New Testament letter called Second Peter. Now, if you've, if you've been around or tracking with Pathway Church for a while, then you know that most of the time we preach topically. So we take a topic, whether it be finances or grace or family or relationship, connection, things like that, and we walk through the scripture and say, what does the Bible say about the subject? And we do a deep dive on a particular subject. But uh, typically during the winter months, we kind of pull back and do an in-depth study of a portion of scripture or a book in the Bible. And I'm excited to do this again. It's it's always an incredible opportunity for us to, to dive deep, to, to look at the author, to look at the context, to study a piece of scripture in depth. And so I want to encourage you uh, to lean in uh, as we do so. Uh, you may remember if you've been around that a number of years ago we walked through 1 Peter. And this was uh, Peter's first letter to the churches, and in it he talks about the external issues that were going on at the time. External issues like Roman persecution, like trials and tribulation, family issues, those types of things that affect us from the outside. And here in his second letter, we're going to see Peter addressing internal issues, things that are going on inside the church, things like apathy, that's a problem within the church and things like false teachers, false ideas about Christ. And, and he's going to talk about those things as we uh, walk through this particular text. One of the things I want to encourage you to do as we kick off this series is I want to encourage you to be reading Second Peter on your own. And I'll tell you this, we're going to be in this uh, book study for six or seven weeks. But if you read this, it's a three chapter book. It's, it's a quick read. But if you read it every week, If you read it a few times a week, then when you come and you listen, whether it be online or in person, uh, you're going to hear me teaching or others teaching on this text, and you're going to get so much more out of it. Um, You know, recently I was watching one of my favorite movies uh, with my kids. I won't tell you what it was because it's kind of cheesy, but we're watching this movie, and I've seen the movie so many times, but I've noticed that every time I watch the movie, something else jumps out of me. Something, I notice something about the characters, something about the dialogue that I didn't notice before. And the same is true as we read God's word, as we open up and read Second Peter multiple times each week, uh, you'll get so much more when we come to the text. The other thing I want to encourage you to do, if you're willing to do this, is to make notes in the margin of your Bible. I, I've got my Bible here. You probably can't see that, but all around the perimeter, uh, there are notes. And I've had this Bible a little over 10 years, and I'm very hesitant to give it up. 
And the reason why is because for the last 10 to 12 years, I've been making notes, highlighting. If you were to read through my Bible, you're going to see like sermon notes and just definitions and all these things in the margin of the Bible. And, uh, and that's why I keep hanging on to this old Bible. It's fallen apart. It's actually being held together like most of our church with Gorilla Tape. You can see that on the edge. Uh, but I don't want to get rid of it. And I'll tell you, as you're studying the Bible, it's very helpful to make notes, highlights in your Bible. Uh, that way, the next time you read it, you remember the things uh, that God has spoken to you uh, through his word. So today, as we dive in to this letter of uh, 2 Peter, uh, this is generally accepted to be Peter's final letter before his death, uh, probably written around AD 65, thereabouts. Uh, he's going to die within a, a few years of writing this text. And, uh, and so as we open up the text today, let's just look at 2 Peter, uh, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. Let's we'll look at the first two words. It says, Simeon Peter. So if you're wondering who wrote it, there's, <laughs> there's the indication that it was actually written by uh, none other than Simon Peter. You'll know uh, Peter is the one, he was a fisherman that Jesus called. Uh, Peter is the one who walks on water. Peter is the one who denies Christ uh, right before his crucifixion. Peter is the one who stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches the very first sermon in the church. Peter is a, is a very important character. And, and, and here our text tells us that he wrote it. Now you'll notice that it actually starts with his name. And the way we write letters today, it's like, Dear John... Right? And then we write all this stuff, and then like on the third page at the very end, sincerely, Nathan Blake. So you actually have to flip to the end to find out who wrote the letter. Uh, in the ancient world, they actually addressed uh, the letter uh, to themselves so that other people could know exactly who it was who was writing. He's a Simeon Peter. Um, now one of the things you may not know about this, sorry to take so long on it, but um, the actual letter of Second Peter is one that historically has been debated about its authenticity. You may say, well, why? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. It says Simeon Peter. But uh, one of the reasons why this uh, text is debated is because there were many other texts in the first and second century that claimed to have Peter as their author. There was the uh, Acts of Peter. There's the Gospel of Peter. And the early church uh, looked at those writings and said, these are not authentic. These are not Peter. Uh, but you'll be uh, glad to know that the early church and the early fathers did acknowledge this particular letter as being written by Peter. One of the reasons why people were skeptical, and some people still are, about the authenticity of this letter is because the style of writing, the grammar, and the language used is different than 1 Peter, which I think is most easily explained by the fact that Peter used a scribe. And he actually discusses how in 1 Peter, Silvanus helped him to write it, and so different scribe, different language, uh, but we believe this is authentically the writing of Peter. There are lots of commonalities and similar ideas from First and Second Peter. And so he is the author of this uh, particular book. He goes on to say this, Simeon Peter, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I love that he introduces himself first as a servant and then as an apostle. I don't know about you, but if I was an apostle, I would be like, Apostle Nathan. That's who I am. People are like, who are you? I'm Apostle Nathan. Nice to meet you. He doesn't do that. He says servant and apostle. He actually believes what Jesus taught, that the first will be last and the last will be first, that the greatest of these is the one who serves uh, others. And so he introduces himself as a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is he writing to? We discover this in verse 1. And he continues and says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot jumps out at me here in the text. The first thing is this, that you and I, when we trust in Jesus, have a faith of equal standing with Peter and Paul and James. Isn't that amazing? The same faith, same sons and daughters of God, same access through faith in, and he calls it, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you've ever wondered where in the New Testament does it say that Jesus is also God. Well, here's one of the many texts that we turn to where Peter actually says, it's ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he is our God and our Savior. And when we put our faith in him, we have equal standing with Peter and Paul. We have the same faith, the same inheritance. This is an incredible, incredible text. He continues in verse two and says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing you don't have enough grace 
and enough peace. Did you know that there is more grace and more peace available to you than you currently have? And, and, and Peter's like, I want God's grace and his peace to be multiplied, to be 10 x in your life. And he's going to tell us how we can do that. He says, how do we increase in grace and peace? He says, may it be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus our Lord. Now, I want to highlight this word knowledge. It's a really important word here in Peter and specifically in the first chapter, okay? Because in the original language in Greek, there's actually two different words being used for knowledge and they're not the exact same, okay? Now, let me introduce these two words. The first word is the Greek word gnosis. And it means information. It means knowledge. It means facts. It's like when you learn something, that's gnosis. But the other Greek word, and the one that he uses here in our text in particular, is epinosis. And the difference between these two is that gnosis is like head knowledge, like facts. And epinosis is like deep experiential knowledge. Here's the best example I can give you, okay? When I was in grade nine, I had a history teacher who loved World War I. And when he was on his summer holidays, he would travel to Europe and visit Passchendaele and all these famous sites where the Canadian military fought. And he would come back and tell us stories and show us artifacts. Like he was so, I mean, he knew more than anyone I've ever met about World War I. But there's a difference between talking to him who gets excited when he talks about World War I and all the facts. And then speaking to a World War I veteran who, I think they're all gone now, but if you would talk to a World War I veteran, they would just start to cry because they were there. They experienced trench warfare. They experienced uh, starvation and the soggy conditions and, and, and people dying. So there's a difference between knowing facts and there's a difference between knowing something deeply. The same can be true. You can talk about what love is and you can describe love, but then you can experience loving someone and what that feels like. The same is true. There are people who know about Jesus. They can quote the Bible stories. They can recite Romans Road and tell you how to be saved. They have all these facts and information about God. But do they really know him? Do they have a personal relationship with you? Do they have gnosis, knowledge, or epinosis, deep experiential knowledge of God? And here's what, here's what Peter's saying to us. Grace and peace are multiplied to you and to me as we come to know him deeply and intimately in our lives. In fact, in Ephesians 3, Paul says a prayer for the Ephesian church, and he says this, he asks that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, the height and depth, to know the love of Christ, to gnosis, to understand the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He says, I'm praying that you would have a deep experiential knowledge of who God is, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's something different about knowing God and experiencing Christ than just hearing facts and information about him. That's, that's what Peter's trying to tell us. Verse three, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, God has all the resources that you and I need. How do we obtain these resources? He says, through the knowledge of him, through the epinosis, through the deep, knowing and experiencing of God who has called us to his glory and excellence. And then he says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So Peter says, listen, God has made promises. You know, the scriptures are thousands of promises to God's people, which is us who trust in Christ, full of promises, things that God says he will do. And we have access to those promises through the knowledge of God. Let me give you an example. I, I heard a message from Skip Heitzig. He's a pastor down in California. And I just love this analogy. And so I wanted to share it with you. Uh, I, have here, uh, I have here a check, okay? And uh, this check, if I'm gonna write you a check, I could write you a check for a uh, million dollars. Wouldn't that be nice? And I could write my name on it. I could write your name on it. I'll write, fill in a million dollars here. And then I could give that to your check. Now this check represents a promise a promise that I'm giving you a million dollars. Uh, now there's one issue. <laughs> when you go to cash the check, uh, the teller's gonna be like, uh, I'm so sorry. Um, this guy <laughs> does not have the power to make that promise. And I, and I love what Peter says. He's like, hey, we have precious promises from God 
But the God that gives us these precious promises has divine power to actually write the check so that we can cash it. And here's what you and I need to understand. God has given us everything we need. He has supplied the grace. He has supplied the forgiveness. He has done everything. Our salvation is paid for in full and he offers it to us. So how do we accept it? How do we live out of this new life and grace and peace and forgiveness that he offers? Well, through the knowledge of him. That's, that's what Peter says. Through knowing him, we begin to cash the checks of God's promises and experience it in our lives. And he continues, he says that through them, through his power and through his promises, you may become partakers in the divine nature, having escaped corruption that's in the world because of sinful desires. So here's the idea. When Adam and Eve sinned, the world fell into sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, human nature fell into sin, separated from God. Christ came to redeem us. Christ came to pay the price for sin. Christ came so that you and I could be, in Jesus' own words, born again. So that his spirit could come in and begin to transform us from the inside out. That, that we wouldn't just one day get to heaven and be transformed, but that the transformation process begins today, begins now. It begins through faith and knowledge of God. And we start changing from the inside out. That's the promise that is made just like I was born into the Bleff family, okay, I didn't do that. My parents did that, okay? And, and as a Blay, I guess I probably have an inheritance of some kind, right? Uh, but that, that is mine because I'm born in that. I did, do not, I did nothing to achieve or obtain that. And in the same way, you and I can do nothing to become children of God. It's, it's His grace. It's His forgiveness. But once I became a Blay, there were expectations I had to do certain things. I had to behave in certain ways. I was called to become the best Blay possible. And in the same way, we enter into God's family by grace. But guess what? Peter's going to be very clear. We don't just accept Jesus, have knowledge of who he is. He saved me. And that's the end. He says, oh, no, no, no. You have to grow in grace. You have to become more like Christ each day. That your epinosis your knowledge your intimate and real knowledge of god actually has to change the way we live the way we think the way we treat other people it has to impact our character that there should be fruit and evidence that we are christians it's not just head knowledge it's transformational deep knowledge that's what he's talking about and so in in this way peter is saying god has done it all man he's written the, he's written the check he has the power to give you salvation and everything you need but You and I also have a part to play. We must grow in grace and we must continue. And then he continues verse five, for this reason, for this reason, make every effort. Now I know in in church, people don't like to talk about effort, right? Because it's like, well, it's all grace. God did it all and we don't try. We don't try to earn salvation and that's true, but, but we are supposed to run the race. We are supposed to put on the armor of God and get to work. We are supposed to make an effort to grow in grace. And he, he's going to give us a list. Let me share this list with you real quick. He says that make every effort to supplement your faith. Now, you know you supplement when you don't have enough of something, right? Like I, I, I take uh, cod liver oil pills. Uh, and I do that because I, I hate fish and I don't like eating fish. And apparently there's good stuff in fish. So I'm just trusting other people. And I, and I take these things. They're nasty. Okay, but I'm supplementing something that isn't in my diet. And and what Peter's saying is, hey, you might have Christ, you might have the Holy Spirit in your heart, but there's there's stuff still missing in your life. You have to grow in grace. And so I want you to supplement your faith with these things. Number one, virtue, which could be described as your character or praiseworthiness, the thing about your life that other people look and go, man, I want to be more like that. He's like, "You you need to grow in that. And then he says, I want you to grow in knowledge. And this is head knowledge. He's like, read books read your Bible, go take a class, right? Learn about God, like actually fill your head with good knowledge. That's a good thing to do as a Christian, right? Christians shouldn't just be about faith. You need to add knowledge. Then he says, add self-control, add self-control to that. Self-control is the ability to rule over your emotions and passions, etc. He says, add steadfastness, which is patience, the ability uh, to wait Add godliness, which is the ability and the desire to do what is right in the moment. He says, add brotherly affection. This is how you treat the people around you, the people in your church, the people in your family. And then finally, he says, and then all this, add love, which encompasses the rest. And he's talking about the the God kind of love. So he's like, hey, as a Christian, getting a check from God, being getting your ticket stamped to go to heaven, that's not enough. 
we got to grow in grace. We need to progress forward. We need to be abounding in these things. And then he continues and says, if these things are yours and are increasing. So if you're growing in grace, if these things are increasing in your life, they will keep you and me from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The worst thing possible is to know about God's love and grace and know about all that he requires of us and to do nothing about it. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible to have knowledge of God and Jesus and to still have an unfruitful life? Yes, it is. Let me ask it another way. Is it possible to know how to build muscle and get strong and get weaker? Well, sure it is. If you don't do, if you don't act on what you know, then it won't work. How about is it possible to know how to build wealth, how to save and invest and still get poorer month after month? Sure it is. Some of us are working on that right now. All right, it's possible if we don't apply what we know. And that's exactly what Peter is saying. Look, it's not enough just to know about Jesus. It's not enough to know about God. We have to actually do some stuff with what we've been given. We got to actually, through the knowledge of him, cash the checks that God has given us, his promises, and live out our faith in a way that impacts others. It must be lived out. The Christian faith is absolutely no different. And so he says this in verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities, so if you're a Christian and you have knowledge of God and you trust in him and all this stuff, but nothing changes in your life, he says that that person is so nearsighted that they're blind. They actually don't even realize that the faith they claim to have and the, the knowledge of God they claim to have is not doing any good, having forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. If we claim to know God, but we don't have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we're blind to the fact that we don't really know Him. Verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. He says, look at If the fruit of the Spirit, if you're growing in grace, that will be the evidence that you have the true knowledge of God, that you actually know who He is that you've actually received his precious promises, it will impact your life and change you. And if you see that change happening, that's how you know. How do you know if you're a Christian? Some people might respond and say, well, I prayed a prayer when I was five. I prayed a prayer when I was 20. I got baptized. I was baptized as an infant. I go to church. I give, put money in the offering. These are the reasons why I know I'm a Christian. Well, that's actually not how we know. Peter's like, we know because we see the knowledge of God and who he is changing us. That's how we know that we're actually his. That's how we know that the spirit has actually come to dwell in us. We're different. We're changing. See, I prayed a prayer when I was five. I rededicated my life in Bible college. But I don't know that I'm a Christian because I prayed a prayer. I actually know because I prayed this morning. I actually know, not because I trusted him 20 years ago, because I'm trusting him to save me today. That's the difference. See, it, it's not about something you do. It's about, an, it's a direction. It's, a, it's an attitude that we have towards him. And, and, and Peter's like, listen, if you're loving Jesus and you have a desire to worship him and a desire to read his word and a desire to be in community, even if you haven't got it figured out yet, if that desire is there and you're moving in the direction and growing in grace, that's the sign because you wouldn't be doing any of that unless God was at work in you, unless he had called you to himself. And so he continues in verse 11 and says, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I read a number of commentaries on this passage because it sounds like he's saying, if you're growing in grace, you'll get into heaven. But that's actually not uh, what most scholars believe he's saying. He's actually talking about how you enter into heaven. Did you know that not everyone will enter heaven the same way? In this text, there's an allusion to how the Roman generals would return to Rome after conquering some other nation, and the people would line the streets, and there would be celebrations, and there would be parades and music, and they would come into great fanfare. If you've ever seen any of the old movies, like Cleopatra, you see like this great parade coming in. And he's actually talking about how if we are faithful to Christ and continually growing in love and grace and mercy, that when we enter into heaven, there will be a reward for our faithfulness. There'll be a parade going like, I can't believe they're finally here. This is amazing. This person has been so faithful to Christ, maybe even gave their life for Christ. And when you enter into heaven, there's like rewards and you get a crown of life and well done, good and faithful servant. But did you know there are some who will get into heaven by the skin of their teeth <laughs> and they'll walk through the pearly gates or whatever is going to happen. And, and people there will be like, Wow, you made it. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the person that just squeaks into heaven. I don't want someone who I don't want to be someone who just believed and had enough faith to get through the doors. But when I get to the other side and I meet my Lord and Savior, I want to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Here's a crown for faithfulness. This is what Peter is inviting us into. Growing in grace so that one day a rich entrance or um, we richly provided for you an entrance into the kingdom of God in this way, a celebration of all uh, that you accomplished because of his grace. Verse 12, therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth, I say this often, and I'll continue to say it. Most of us don't need new knowledge. It's like, I need to come to church and I hear, need to hear something new about God. No, you don't. <laughs> Most of us have knowledge of God that we're not living up. Most of us need to be reminded to be generous or be reminded to forgive or be reminded to show kindness or brotherly affection. We need to be reminded because we forget and it stops becoming a priority for us. We don't need new knowledge. Jesus said this, he who hears my words and does them is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Guys, it's not about how many Bible verses we know. It's about how many Bible verses we do. That's what Peter's saying. He's like, hey, you've heard about Jesus. You know the scriptures. What are you going to do with it? And I think that's the question that each and every one of us needs to wrestle with today and in the coming week. What are we going to do with it? We have great and precious promises backed by God's divine power. We have the spirit of the living God living inside of us. What are we going to do with that? Sit on the couch, do nothing, be selfish. He's like, no, no, grow in grace, add faithfulness, add brotherly affection to build upon what God has done. Verse 13, he says, I think it right as long as I'm in the body, in other words, as long as I'm still alive, to stir you up by way of reminder. He's like, I'm writing to you to remind you of stuff you already know because you need to be reminded since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. Peter's like, I know I'm going to die soon because Jesus told me. Like, you know, when Jesus tells you you're going to die soon, you're going to die soon. He knows he's going to be gone. And he's like, I'm writing this letter to remind you of stuff I've already told you, stuff that you and I need to remember and put into practice. And he says, I'll make every effort so that after my departure, when I'm no longer with you in body, that you may be able to at any time recall these things. So here's where I want to wrap things up today. Are you growing in grace? You can ask yourself the question, am I growing in grace? Do I have a faith that's just in my head? Or do I have a faith that's impacting my life? Does the grace of God and the salvation that he's offered me, the forgiveness of sin, the great uh, precious promises, it, it is all of that stuff. Am I receiving that and am I living it out? Am I growing in these characteristics that Peter outlines for us or, or am I apathetic? And I got to be honest, there's some times when I feel like I'm being pretty apathetic and I need to get my butt in gear. I need to make every effort to continue to grow in love to continue to grow in patience. Patience is a tough one for me. I don't know what it is for you, but are you growing in grace? Does the knowledge that you have in your head about God and what he's done for you actually translate into the way you live? Does it change you? As Peter actually says that when we see ourselves growing in grace, then we know that we are saved. Then we know that God truly is at work in us and it gives us the confidence to move forward. So today I want to ask you, is your faith that you have, is it just in your head or is it in your heart? Is it a fruitless faith that doesn't impact your life or is it a real faith that produces fruit and changes everything? As we continue in this uh, study in 2 Peter, we're going to continue on these themes of growing in grace. What does it look like to receive all that God has given to us and to have that translate into our daily lives, how we treat others? the things we look at, the things we spend our time on. How do we change based on what God has done in our lives? So let me close. I'm going to pray with you, and then we're going to walk through communion together. Heavenly Father, thank you as we open up uh, your word, as we read these words of Peter before his death. God, I pray that each one of us will be challenged to ask the question, am I growing in grace? Are the things that I believe about you and is what I know about you impacting the way I live? Is it impacting my heart and mind? Is it changing and transforming me? 
God, would you help us to grow in our character? Would you help us to be transformed, to grow in virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love? Lord, may these be the signs that you are truly at work in our hearts, that as sons and daughters of God, we don't just sit stagnantly with our faith, but that these things are being growing and developing in our lives, producing fruit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking And I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful to generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I build my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail? Today is the first Sunday of the month, and as such, we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper, also called communion. This is something that we do each month as a church, and want to be able to participate in that together. I want to read today uh, from John chapter 6, and in this chapter, Jesus makes a very bold claim. He actually says, I am the bread of life. He goes on um, to say this. He says, no one comes to the Father. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. He goes on to say, and this is in uh, John 6, uh, in verse 47, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate bread in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, anyone receives me, is what he's saying. He will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus makes this claim during his ministry, and later he would have a meal with his disciples before his death on the cross. And he takes the bread, and he breaks it, and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Uh, so today we receive the bread, we receive the cup in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. 
what we talked about in the message today about knowledge, epinosis of God, realizing what he has done and not just being like, oh, here's a cracker, here's some bread, here I'm just like doing this thing because it's a Christian thing to do. This is serious. We take this in remembrance of him. When we receive this bread, it's a symbol that we are not just eating something, but we're actually receiving all that he did for us and all that that entails and that we intend to live out of his sacrifice and out of his death for us. So if you have bread with you and you're a follower of Christ, I want to invite you to participate with us and we're going to take the bread and we're going to receive it with thanksgiving. This is his body broken for us. Let's eat it together. And afterwards, um, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood, the blood of a new covenant that God establishes with us. And because of Christ's death and because of his blood shed, we can become sons and daughters of God and enjoy all of God's power and all of his great and precious promises that we talked about because Jesus died and shed his blood for us. So we receive that as well with thanksgiving. Let's drink. Lord, today we, we thank you for your great sacrifice. And we understand, God, that we are saved, that we are made sons and daughters of God, not because of anything we've done, but wholly because of what you've done for us. But God, we also recognize that we need to be transformed by that work. And we pray, God, that in the week ahead, that we would continue to grow in grace and love and truth and mercy and kindness. So God, help us to live out of these great power and promises you've given us. Help us to live as salt and light in this world, sharing your love with those around us because of what you did for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Rain came, wind blew, my house was built on you, and I'm safe with you. Guys, thanks for joining. Um, it's great having you around this week. Um, as always, if you support us um, financially, prayerfully, just by joining online, um, thank you. Uh, we love you guys. 
And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye, Mom.